All right, so this is part two. Um, I'm sorry that I have to break them up incrementally like this, but I'm not about to pay for software. And honestly, this breaks it up into bite-sized pieces for you guys. You should be taking breaks every 15 minutes with information like this anyway, so hopefully that ends up working out. We left off here, okay? And now we're going to move on to the second part. So we talked about subject matter. Now we're going to look at style. Okay, when we do stylistic or formal analysis, okay, um, we're talking about the components that make up um, a piece of art. So the visual characteristics of um, a work of art. So um, here we have, I don't even know where to put my face. <laughs> uh, here we have two pieces that are characteristic of the Renaissance. Okay. You can see similarities and differences, but at the end of the day, they're both pretty close to what you would expect a Renaissance piece to be, um, including the sort of idealized form of, or the human form, um, and the way that the characters are posed. For example, this sort of pose is pretty characteristic of the women portrayed in Renaissance pieces. Okay, and the period style is a style of visual art that is typical of a particular time period. So these ones fit the Renaissance style of art. There's also regional styles and personal styles. So there are uh, like certain regions that are um, have certain characteristics to their art. Um, I know, I know. And personal style. So down like even within a particular genre or period certain artists have different um stylistic choices that sort of identify them so uh style changes over time and it gives insight into how humanity functioned and thought so for oh. example both of these paintings depict the same biblical event but they are very different and what do those differences tell us about the artist and his or her views of his or her views of mankind? So look at the depiction here. On one hand, there are two very different types of art, right? One of them looks like it's more like a relief type painting. Not a relief painting, I'm sorry. A fresco painting. And this one is obviously like ink. But the portrayal of Adam and Eve here and here are very different. So pause the video and think about what sort of attitudes are being taken or shown through the human form and toward humanity um, in these paintings. All right, and hopefully while you paused, you kind of considered um, The sort of strength and curvature that are present here, okay? The environment that surrounds them. I believe that's the serpent. And they're being tempted by the great deceiver himself, represented by the snake. And then here, they are getting ousted, okay, by the angel here. Um, and they are angular, they are ashamed, they are contrite. And they are, for whatever reason, so skinny that you can see their ribs. Okay. Um, there's a lot being said here. You could say that they're making visual arguments in a way. And that's because of the particular styles that are present. Throughout history, and you guys don't have this handout because this was used when we went to the art museum a couple semesters ago. Um, these are generally the sort of breakdown of like historical art movements. So we have the Stone Age, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, all the way through ancient Roman art. Then we have um, Eastern art here, the Middle Ages, early and high Renaissance. Then the Northern Renaissance, which is different from the early and high. Baroque, neoclassical romanticism, realism, Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, Favism, Expressionism, Cubism, Dada, and Surrealism, Abstract Expressionism, and Postmodernism and Deconstructivism. So we talk about the modern Western art movements, 
but I will um, in a separate PowerPoint that I'll put um, a video on for you guys as well. Um, but I want to just kind of give you a visual crash course in ancient art to refresh your memory so we can see the progression of ideas from one uh, era to the next. Um, so we understand the sort of origins of our Western art and how it relates to our philosophies. Okay, so the Paleolithic or Stone Age um, cave art. Art served a different purpose then than it does now. It was to record history. So um, they used black or red pigments because that was easily accessible given the natural elements that they um, had access to, so iron oxides and charcoal. Uh, there are a few humans depicted, mostly animals, um, including those that are now extinct, which kind of gives us insight into the creatures that roamed the earth before our modern existence. They're mostly abstract in form and style, um, and obviously rather two-dimensional. Um, society at this time was hunter-gatherer, hence the things that are depicted are very relevant to that. You marked yourself with pen. Um, relevant to that particular lifestyle. Okay, and this is a cave painting of a bison. 15,000 BCE, which is just the most bonkers date I've ever said out loud in my life. It doesn't even feel like that exists. Okay, and this is in Spain. I'm not even going to uh, attempt to pronounce French because I, I, I don't know how to pronounce French. But this, these are horses. And you can see there's actually a little bit more depth here than there was in this, what is allegedly a bison. So you can see um, a little bit more realism. Obviously still very abstract and two-dimensional. This is in France. Honey, you gotta stop whining. Stonehenge are megalithic structures, so mega big, lithic is stone, rock. Okay. Um, I don't know if any of you guys watch Outlander or read the books, but these are present in a lot of Scottish and Highland mythologies. Mesopotamian art and architecture, which I think you guys take an ancient civ class at some point in the curriculum here. Okay, so the land between the rivers, um, which is Mesopotamia, uh, in the Tigris-Euphrates rivers are the two rivers here that sort of um, encapsulate the Fertile Crescent, include Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, and Persian art. So um, there are city-states, kingdoms, and empires, cities fortified with public buildings and irrigation systems, the, really the origins of the modern world that we have, but in the ancient world. Okay. Armies were organized and well-equipped. War and conquest were emphasized over hunter-gatherer. Um, and religion became significant. So we're seeing a progression of society and civilization and our understanding, understandings of those terms. So we start seeing architecture as an extension of the art and culture of a particular people. So here's a relief. Okay, So it's a, a sculpture into a stone. And this is a man named Sargon standing before a tree of life. Okay, an iconography of the tree of life is, um, I mean, this biblical image in mythology, biblical mythology as much as it is in sort of ancient Eastern um, tradition. The idea that life um, can be encapsulated or symbolized by a tree. It's pretty common across all cultures. This is a Stella. So up here we have a... A relief sculpture with Hammurabi's code. So we, if we zoomed in here in a really high resolution photo, um, we would be able to see Hammurabi's code, which was sort of like the precursor to something like the Ten Commandments. And it's Babylonian. This is the Ishtar Gate in Iraq, which is a reconstruction. This is a reconstruction, but um, it's at the ruins of Babylon. Okay, and honestly, quite beautiful. This is the Mesopotamian god of the underworld. It's a terracotta relief sculpture, so it's that red clay type substance. And then Egyptian art parallels its political history, right? So animals, deities, female figures, vases, pottery, architecture, jewelry, and adornments are where we see their art manifest. Can you stop it? 
Anubis weighing the soul of Ani from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. This should make you think of Prince of Egypt. This is the Step Pyramid. You know about pyramids, I should hope. This would be considered architectural. And the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid of Khufu and Giza. The more I look at this, the more astounded I am that this was <laughs> man-made. <laughs> it's just bonkers. Okay. Um, and then Egyptian jewelry, obviously, um, is huge. Um, and makeup was part of their sort of artistic and cultural expression as well. Um, this is Nefertiti, and it's painted limestone. And then Greek and Hellenistic art. Okay, so this is um, what the Renaissance ends up trying to recreate and revisit in the Renaissance, right? The rebirthing of classical art. And this is the classical art it's trying to uh, portray. So this Greek idealism um, of the human form, of culture, there's balance, perfection of the human form, and then the architectural prowess and beauty that sort of... Um, we emerged in the United States, actually. A lot of our um, original, like, founding buildings uh, imitate this particular type of architecture. So, um, we've got a couple different things going on here. We've got a statue of a prince without a crown. Not really sure who it is, but it's right here. Um, similar to what you might see, like the statue of David. Okay. Here's um, a scene from the Alexander sarcophagus, so Alexander the Great. And then Aphrodite and Eros fighting off the advances of Pan, the god of mm, debauchery, I think. I could be wrong, but it's who Peter Pan is based off of. So this is Aphrodite, this is Eros, and this is Pan. architecture. This is the Doric temple from the classical period, probably dedicated to the goddess Hera, who was Zeus's wife, among many other women that he was with. Um, there are three orders of ancient Greek architecture. The Corinthian, which is the, the latest, okay, the Ionic, which is in the middle period, and then the Doric, which is what's, what's pictured here. Here are the three types of columns. So, we've got the Doric here, and then the Ionic, and then the Corinthian. Um, notice they each have sort of unique characteristics, um, hence they have three different names. These are Corinthian order columns. I snapped this picture when I was in Greece, um, back when I was in college, um, and you can sort of see the ornate um, sculpture there at the top. These are more Corinthian order columns. They are massive. This is another shot from Greece when I was there. It's beautiful. And then this is the Parthenon, um, when I was, again, in Athens, Greece. Um, and these are Ionic order columns, so this is from the Middle Period. And the Caryatids um, at the Parthenon as well um, serve as columns on this particular building at the Acropolis, which means on top of the city. And then mosaics and paintings. I'm going to have you guys look through the rest of this because I'm running out of time. Um, but these are all pictures you've probably seen before, ideally. I just want you to get a visual feel for the um, types of art we see across the world.